Thank you, Meredith. Can you hear me? Yeah? Thank you. Um, so this is nominally a review talk, but it's not really a review talk. Um, and the reason for that is that there's another meeting in a few weeks that are just going to publish big reviews. So I thought I'd prefer to kind of give you a review of the last maybe 18 months of what we're doing in millimeter interferometry that's preparing us for the next generation of interferometry measurements with the ALMA uh, interferometer. Uh, so this is sort of a, review is the wrong word, I guess, but. <laughs> so let me get started by explaining why, um, why millimeter radio observations are so important for studying circumstellar disks. Um, and the, the real answer is that the, those wavelengths are incredibly physically rich. They contain a lot of information. And the reason, as I kind of jokingly say over here, is because disks are cool, literally cool. Uh, and the reason for that is you have access to dust continuum emission over most of the disk volume. Most of these disks are actually, most of the mass in these disks is actually fairly cold. Um, and so the continuum emission emits preferentially or most efficiently at millimeter, submillimeter wavelengths. The most um, useful part of that dust continuum emission is that it's optically thin um, at wavelengths longer than a few hundred microns. Um, so that gives you access to some mass information that you don't have at shorter wavelengths. Um, so the intensity profile is basically uh, telling you the product of the optical depth and the temperatures. And if you have some means of estimating the temperature structure, you can actually measure the, the optical depth and hopefully um, you can relate that to the dust properties and the amount of material available to you. The best part is that there's no contrast issues um, like in the, the infrared. Uh, so the stars are actually very, very faint. And so you don't have to actually worry about um, all these tricks to actually make the star disappear. I just kind of give an example here of, of, of a disk. This is from the SMA. It's an 880 micron disk. And the point is that you're just basically sensitive to 95% or more of the mass in the disk. You're seeing all the way to the midplane all where the action the plant formation process is happening. In the infrared, you're getting mostly structure information, geometric structure information, because you're seeing less than 1% of the mass way up in the atmosphere of the disk. So you're learning about the actual vertical geometric structure of the disk. It's sort of a different complementary process. Um, you also simultaneously have access to a, a very rich molecular spectrum at millimeter wavelengths. You're seeing pure rotational transitions and the intensity profiles are telling you something about the gas temperatures, the abundance, abundance profiles of various molecules, um, something about chemistry, which I'm not going to talk about. Um, and you also have access, because you have these, these sort of heterodyne instruments, you have access to the velocity fields at very high spectrum resolution. So you can learn a lot about the velocity fields, and I'll sort of briefly mention that at the end as a, as a new approach that we're trying to make better use of. Um, the, the key point that I want to take away here is that you often hear that, that submillimeter emission is sort of sensitive to the cool outer disk. And, and part of that's, I'm complicit in this kind of natural uh, phraseology um, for, for these wavelengths. And that's true, you're most sensitive to the cool outer disk. But that's really sort of a, a resolution limitation, right? Because we've only been able to get sort of quarter arc second resolution so far. Almost gonna change all of that. And you can see, you'll, you'll be very sensitive to emission on very small scales. Um, so it's, it's not just cold emission that we can see. Um, for these things. That's sort of a misconception I wanted to clear up a little bit. So the problem is that this has been very difficult to do. Um, for maybe 20 years, people have been using um, small, uh, uh, few element interferometers um, uh, to actually do this. So these disks on the sky are sort of an arc second or less um, across. So uh, you need long baseline interferometry to actually do this. It's very time consuming. It's very expensive, uh, observationally expensive. And maybe these numbers will actually surprise you. They, they don't really surprise those of us working in the field, but they might surprise those of you who are thinking that there's a lot of papers about millimeter interferometry of disks. But only a few tens of disks have been observed at sub arc second resolution in the continuum. Um, and maybe 10, maybe a dozen disks have been observed in uh, sub arc second resolution in molecular lines. So this is very, very small samples to date and very hard work. Um, and I just want to kind of, I, I use these two panoramas to give you some sense of the scale at which things are going to change. So the top panel is the submillimeter array on Mauna Kea. And you can see individual elements. There's eight of them. And they're spread over about 500 meter baselines in this configuration. And this is Alma, I don't know, a few months ago. 
And these are almost to scale, roughly, by eye. Just to give you an idea, so you have many more apertures, and you can get a much wider range, range of baseline lengths to give you an idea of how things are going to go. So the, the fundamental promise that ALMA offers for circumstellar disk studies is demographics. We're no longer dealing in a few tens of sources and a lot of effort. We're talking eventually in a 10 year time frame or something like that, you'll have thousands of disks at high angular resolution to be able to observe. So it's a very exciting time to, to get involved. I don't think I need to convince you of that because if you throw out all the proposals in the first two cycles of ALMA um, for everything that wasn't disk, so you're just, you're just proposing for disks, I think we'd still be oversubscribed. So I think I've convinced our, the infrared uh, observers have been convinced of this, and everyone's actively going after ALMA observations. So the big questions for, for the context of this talk is basically trying to constrain the planet formation process. And so what is it, what is it that we really want to know? Um, and I've, I've written down four bullet points. And let me just say this first one I'm not, not going to talk about because I only have 30 minutes and not 40. <laughs> but that's the effect of the hoster environment, and that's something that demographics will actually give us a lot of information on. And I'm not going to talk about it because it's supposed to be, this is going to be focused more on what the interferometer is extremely important for in terms of spatial filtering properties and high angular resolution. You don't necessarily need that for, to do some basic host demographics, environment demographics. But there's some talks later in this conference and, and a bunch of posters on the subject. We just wrote a paper about it as well if you're interested. I'm going to focus on these three points, um, sort of going backwards in time from the planet formation process. So the first thing is looking for actual signposts of planet formation in these disks, trying to see the interactions of young planets and their natal disk material, and what we can do to actually potentially learn about planets um, indirectly. Then I'm going to talk about some important evolutionary diagnostics, um, and I'll, I'll finish with some comments about the actual structures of these disks and what we can learn about the initial conditions for planet formation. So first part is about signposts of young planetary systems. You've probably all seen this figure in one way or the other. This is part of the, the, the sales pitch for ALMA, basically um, Sebastian Wolf simulations of dynamical interactions between uh, a planet and its, and its natal gas disk and how you could actually observe this. This is a hydro calculation. And this is a 350 micron ALMA simulation with 15 kilometer baselines, which is the hardest thing ALMA will basically ever do. Um, it turns out that it actually isn't this hard to do this uh, project, because this is just dealing with really small scales. I, I know you can't see this, but it says 5 AU is that scale bar right there. So the basic idea here is that you have a planet embedded in a disk. This is Frederick Massey's uh, Fargo code simulation. And basically, two things are happening. The planet's actually going to migrate in towards the central star. There's a dashed line here. I hope this repeats. Yeah, OK. There's a dashed line here that shows a fixed semi-major axis. The planet actually moves in as it's accreting mass and it's evolving. For observational purposes, it does something really important. It actually clears away disk material, right? And that's the signature that we're going to look for. Um, and I, as obviously, we can actually see it, because I'm showing you here a ring of, of dense dust emission um, from Jeff Matthews' PhD thesis work. Um, the important point about th these kinds of simulations, which have driven a lot of our study of the planet formation process, and especially these population synthesis models, is that the planet properties that we measure in the exoplanet population are not their initial properties. They might have very little to actually do with their initial properties, because they've not only moved, but they've also changed their mass as they're moving in a very coupled, uh, dynamic way. Um, so if you actually want to understand planet formation, you'd like to actually connect the exoplanet population to the initial conditions when you watch these planets forming in their disks, undergoing these dynamical interactions. And the trick to doing that is looking for the signature of the structural modification of these disks. Um, so this is just some schematic that I drew like a child uh, to this diagram to give you an idea of what's actually happening. Um, but the point I wanted to make is that we often talk about disks as, as initial conditions. And as I'll show you in this talk, that we don't really have a good handle on true initial conditions in disks. And it's my contention that these are the initial conditions, these initial processes that you should be worried about for planet formation, is this interaction phase, however short-lived it might actually be, is what changes the exoplanet population properties that we see. So here's just some more examples from the SMA. These are 880 micron images, a bunch of transition disks. There's probably two or three dozen of these now. Um, and you should take a look 
you can see a gallery of these um, in, in the PP6 chapter that Catherine Espyat will, um, will be leading in a few weeks. I just wanted to make a few kind of observational points about these, these transition disks. Um, the first is something that's just pure counting, um, and that's my contribution. That's like the one thing that I can do well is count. Um, these, these are common features, sort of surprisingly common. We looked at a bunch of really bright disks um, that we can get good high resolution images of, and, and like a third of them actually have these very large cleared cavities, large meaning radii from 15 to sort of 75 AU. Um, that might be a selection bias um, toward high mass disks. We don't know yet because we don't quite have the sensitivity until almost uh, kind of doing large, larger surveys. Um, but it's sort of surprising. Um, we think that, they, that these central regions are cleared by faint companions. And you'll hear more about this in, in some talks um, by, by Mike Island uh, tomorrow, I guess. Um, and the reason is that many of these other mechanisms that have been proposed for this sort of transition disk, incidentally, these are called transition disks. You'll probably hear that term a lot. It's a silly term, but it's a classic astronomy term where you're transitioning between something that's there and something that's not. Somehow binary is always where we start. And, and then everything that's not in one of the binary categories is in transition. Um, I, I'm not sure if that's true or not, but that's, that's the terminology. Um, so we think that these are cleared by faint companions, um, actually, um, planetary or, or brown dwarf companions. Um, and, and another point I want to make is that these, these cavities, you see these cleared looking rings in the millimeter images. Um, they're depleted is the right word. They're by no means empty. There's gas inside them. There is small grain dust inside them. This is a good case of this. That This is a scattered light image from the SEEDS project by Kate, Kate Follett wrote this paper earlier this year, where this dashed line is basically the size of this millimeter emission. You see all the scattered light inside it from small dust grains. So they're not empty, right? They're depleted, and this is causing a lot of confusion at this point um, as well. The, the important point that I want you to take away from this is that the thing, you know, if these are being caused by low mass companions, I'm just using planet interchangeably. Um, the structure that you actually see is related to the properties of the planet, related to its orbit and potentially related to its mass. So let me describe the sort of emerging picture that's coming out of this um, theoretical work. Uh, this is an idea that, that Simon Partikuper and, and others came up with uh, many years ago, and it's been explored in more detail by um, Paula Pania and her collaborators, but here's just some schematic from uh, a model by Phil Armitage where you have this gap and you have planet and the planet's actually accreting mass. And some of it's getting through to the inner disk, which explains why it's depleted, but not empty, depending on the mass of the planet is what acts sort of like a nozzle for the material to flow through it. A more massive object will accrete more of the material and less material will get through the, to the inner disk. It also acts as a filter. Um, so it allows small dust grains to go with the gas, but do it doesn't allow large dust grains. They, they get blocked up. So here's an example of, of why that's happening. You have gas pressure as a function of disk radius. And in this model, there's a one Jupiter mass planet at 20 AU. Don't ask me how it got there. That's not my problem. There's a one, <laughs> there's a one Jupiter mass planet at 20 AU. And you have basically where the gas pressure goes up, again, at the peak of the gas pressure, you actually collect solid particles. Right? So these particles are drifting in, I'll explain that process in a moment, and they get trapped there. And then they create these very uh, dense dust rings that we actually observe with a similar way. Um, the important thing to notice here is this offset from where the planet is. So the planet's not right inside the dust ring. It's actually, it can be quite a ways inside of it as well. So, so you have to kind of take into account the dynamics of the dust relative to the gas to understand what's going on with the planet. And I just want to kind of give an example of this process, this is V4046 Sag. Um, this is a very old disk, I don't know what that means. You can talk to Catherine Rosenfeld and go see her poster about it. But this is the gas disk, and in the very center of the gas disk, you have this kind of distinctive ring pattern of millimeter emission. So this is our SMA image where we just think it's a ring, and you get a little better resolution with ALMA. This is a 450, 430 micron image with ALMA that we just got a few uh, weeks ago. And basically you see this ring and you see this central peak. So you're actually seeing that, a uh, true gap in the disk. Um, so I, I, I hope I gave you some overview of basically what's going on 
with the actual signposts of planets. You'll hear more about that right after me. But now I want to talk a little bit about the major evolutionary phase of these disks, and that's the growth and migration of solids. So this is an, an immense problem in protoplanetary disk evolution, because in order to make planets, you have to grow 14 orders of magnitude in size, which is 42 orders of magnitude in mass, in a few million years from the dust that you incorporate when the disk forms into things like the moon um, in that period of time. Incidentally, if you can't see this, those are little kids inside this meteorite in the American Museum of Natural History, just to give you an idea. And there's all these very complicated processes um, that prohibit or um, promote growth, coagulation, and so on, and, and actually stop or reverse growth. I'm not going to go into the details. You can hear more um, talk about this, particularly at this um, high uh, size and uh, later in the conference. But the key point is that it's only, uh, it's only size scales. The only size scales that we can actually observe astronomically are, are down here at this end. Right? So you're not actually learning about meter-sized planetesimals or larger. Observationally, they just don't emit efficiently enough. But the trick is that these things sort of scale. So if you look at small particles in the outer disk, they're behaving like large particles in the inner disk. And that's sort of the, the point we want to make. So if we look at the small particles far from the star, we can actually learn something about what's going on with planetesimals in the, in the planet formation zone. And so the trick to doing this with optically thin emission is that there's a spectral dependence uh, of the opacities that manifests itself directly observationally. I don't really want to explain the details of what this beta thing means, but beta is just the slope of the opacity spectrum of the dust grain. So this is opacity as a function of frequency. This is the millimeter radio band. And you can see as you get larger and larger particles, that slope gets flatter and flatter. There's nothing really any different about this than, than those of you used to the infrared, where if you have larger dust particles, you get redder colors. Right? It's effectively just redder millimeter colors. The problem is that if you just do photometry, you get pretty weak constraints um, on, on particle evolution models. So this is the opacity index as a function of disk radius for four different particle evolution models randomly chosen. They all happen to have the exact same globally integrated opacity index, believe it or not. Um, and so what you really want to do is actually resolve the colors as a function of radius in these disks. Right? And that's been very hard. Um, this is Andrea Sella's. I think this is the first good attempt at doing this. Andrea Sella did this for R.Y. Tau um, with Karma a few years ago. And these are his 95% confidence intervals on the, on the observation. So this was done at 1 and 3 millimeters. And it's very, very difficult to do. The trick is you need a longer lever arm and frequency. So you go out to centimeter wavelengths with the VLA, and you can actually do a lot better. And we have a big program that's being PI'd by Claire Chandler at NRAO to get centimeter wavelength images of these disks. So here's an example. This is UZ Tau, the UZ Tau system. It's a quadruple system. It's focused on UZ Tau East. So this is different wavelengths, 0.88, 1.4, 2.9, and 9 millimeter observations. And if you're used to looking at millimeter images, you can see this right away, that as you get to longer and longer wavelengths, the emission gets more and more compact. Um, that is, as you go into the inner parts of the disk, the emission gets redder, particles are larger, right? And this is now something that we can actually do. Here's, if you're used to looking at visibility profiles, here's the correlated flux as a function of deprojected baseline. A point source would be flat, so you can see the same color effect, basically. There's an there's a anti-correlation between the size of the emission and the wavelength you're observing at. That is to say, the color profile gets redder as you get closer to the star. This is, a, this is the opacity index as a function of radius. Again, these are sort of two sigma contours as well. Um, so we see this radial variation in the grain size distribution, and we think it's consistent with growth that's limited by radial drift. Here's another example by Laura Perez from part of her thesis. This is just another disk AS209. In fact, I can say this is, this is not an isolated effect. This is happening in every single disk that we can observe. So the terrible, scary thing about that is you can't measure the surface density profile of the dust with just one wavelength. It's, it's sort of wavelength dependent, and that's telling you what you're really measuring is the kind of convolution of, of the growth and migration of solids with the true structure of the disk. The good news is that this is a real opportunity to learn about the growth and migration of solids, the, the real fundamental essence of the planet formation process. 
So let me quickly run through what radial drift is. It's basically a slight pressure differential, basically because the gas feels pressure. The gas rotates at slightly subcaplarian speeds, and the, basically that causes a headwind drag force for some particles, and they actually move in. So you get two effects. You size sort the solids, which I just explained to you. Um, that's just a description here, micron particles and millimeter particles. And you really change the dust to gas ratio at large disk radii. Right, so you get much less dust per mass of gas at large radii. This should be happening in all disks, um, but it's very difficult to actually see the dust to gas ratio as a function of radius because we don't know how to measure gas densities yet. Right, so you can't do this directly, but you can do it sort of indirectly by comparing the sizes of gas and dust disks. And so just to give you an example um, of why, why we're pursuing this, this has been an issue for a long time. When you look at observations, you see the gas disks look a lot bigger than the dust disks. And in the past, we blamed this on sensitivity, basically optical depth effects, because the dust is optically thin and the gas is optically thick. We're just not sensitive enough to see that dust. And so Meredith, as part of her thesis, did a really nice paper showing that this, this could actually be just because we're using an inappropriate model for the gas surface densities. Um, unfortunately, the, the issue doesn't go away. As we get better and better data, it seems to kind of persist. Um, and so here's an example by Olya Panich, where she takes, these are observations of the ion loop disk. You take a model that actually fits the dust uh, observations, and you assume that you have a constant gas to dust or dust to gas ratio. And then you get a gas disk that's just way too small compared to observations. And if you allow a radial decreasing dust to gas ratio, you get something that, that works. These are just some more examples. Here's gas and here's dust observations. These things are are way too sensitive to rule out optical depth effects. Or sorry, they're too sensitive you can rule out optical depth effects. Typically what we're seeing is that the gas traced by the CO is like two to five times larger than the dust disks. And this is really qualitatively consistent with the migration of solids, but we have yet to really test this in a detailed model, which uh, Till Bernsteel, a postdoc working with me, is, is, is actively pursuing. So I wanted to finish um, by talking a little bit about gas structures. I would say this is sort of the least developed um, aspect of this, uh, of this science, but it, it's the one that has the most promise with ALMA, just because of sensitivity to line emission that we haven't had in the past. So these are um, observations, let's see if this starts. These are observations of 12 CO, three to two emission. I'm not sure how well you can actually see this, unfortunately, um, of a data cube of, of the CO molecules. So, Basically, the goal of all molecular line observations, whether you admit it or not, is that you really want to measure the gas surface densities. You want to know how much H2 there is in these disks, and you want to relate that to planet formation mechanisms. The problem is this is really hard, because you can't actually observe H2, because it doesn't have a dipole moment. And you really don't understand the abundance ratios of tracer molecules relative to H2. Um, I think, I hope I've convinced you that using dust is, is now we think is a bad idea because if there's gas, the dust is doing something that the gas tells it to do that we don't quite understand yet, but we know it's happening. So you'd like to use some optically thin lines that you have some abundance information for, but those lines are, are weak. So this third point actually is, is the one that's getting, gonna see the most improvement because you have this sensitivity with, with ALMA. I'd say one of the most challenging things in terms of analysis is that the density and temperature structures of these disks are, are very highly coupled. Um, and differentiating between what's a density and a temperature effect can be very difficult. Um, so the trick um, that, that I think ultimately will work, but it will require a lot of effort, is that the first thing you have to do is actually measure the two-dimensional temperature structure of these disks using a variety of gas lines. Um, so there's, there's sort of two complementary ways to do this, and both of them are being pursued by various groups. One is to actually spectrally map line ratios. So if you look at different um, isotopic ratios or if you look at different transitions of the same line, you actually you sort of sound to different depths into the disk. And you can, you're actually sensitive to a temperature because you're optically thick. So you see the temperature structure radially and vertically, um, and hopefully you can actually model that and back that out. The other trick you'll hear about in a talk later this session by Charlie Chi is to try and find depletion boundaries where effectively you're using chemical effects to know when you've hit a certain temperature. And he'll explain that in a, in a little bit more detail. 
If you can actually map out, get a good model of the temperature structure, you can try and link to a sequence of op op optically thin lines, make some assumptions about the chemistry of those op optically thin lines, and back out the gas structure. So I don't mean to sound too negative about this. Maybe I did. Uh, this is a very, very difficult thing to do. And this is um, the, a constant question we get asked by people who don't work in discs is, when can you give us a sigma H2? Um, and the answer is, it's going to be very difficult to do that. Um, there's, there's an interesting alternative or sort of complementary technique, and that's to try and fully exploit the velocity field information you get. Because you have very high spectral resolution, and you get actually very high spatial resolution, you're effectively mapping out the velocity field of these disks. Um, and you can learn a lot from that. You, uh, in the past, people have used this to get dynamical masses of the stellar host. The host is dominating the mass of the disk, so gravitationally, it should be dominated by Keplerian rotation. And just by measuring the, the rotation curve of a molecule like CO, you can measure the mass of the central star. Um, so that's kind of cool, but it's sort of stellar astrophysics. It's not, not telling you much about the disk itself. Um, one thing that's incredibly promising um, is to use the widths of these lines. So you see this typical Keplerian rotation profile. The widths of these lines are actually influenced by the amount of turbulence in these disks. Um, so Meredith has worked on this, and I think Jake, Jake Simon's got a poster about this as well. There's great promise for this. It's tricky, but this is sort of the most direct technique you can get to the, the phenomenon that dictates the evolution of these disks, which is sort of a turbulent um, evolution. Uh, and this bottom plot, I'm showing a PV diagram, which is uh, sort of highlighting that you, you get access spectrally to the inner part of the disk, right? Because you have a well-behaved differential velocity profile. It's dominated by Keplerian rotation. So if you know the viewing geometry and you get high enough spectral resolution and sensitivity out in the line wings, the line wings are telling you about the inner part of the disk. So this is TW Hydra. This is a paper that, that Catherine Rosenfeld wrote last year. Um, you're seeing these line wings in TW Hydra, which is almost face on. And so you're actually seeing material that's moving at 20 some kilometers per second. That's coming from inside a couple AU of the central star. So even though the angular resolution of these observations is, I, I don't know, one or one and a half arc seconds, which is sort of, you know, 50 AU, you actually have access, kinematic access to the very inner part of the disk. And eventually you can link this with high angular resolution and get a lot of information about the inner disk. It, it's interesting because you can actually link this to infrared spectroastrometry at some point. Um, sorry, infrared spectroscopy at some point um, with, with ALMA. Uh, and you can get access to the whole rotational and vibrational spectrum of a single molecule. And the last point here is, is a subtle one. And it's the one that I want to sort of finish on. But the velocity field can actually tell you a lot about the structure of the disk. Um, typically, so this is height in the disk and this is radius. And these are just models. And this is the velocity relative to Keplerian velocity. So zero is orange, right? So this is basically what everyone assumes when they model these disks, that you have Keplerian rotation. It's a perfectly reasonable assumption. Um, but the problem is that you're actually, the data is becoming so good, you have to worry about deviations from the perfectly Keplerian thing. So the, the first deviation is actually just properly accounting for the vertical geometry of the disk. The typical assumption is that these disks are geometrically thin. And now that we're seeing these observations from ALMA, we realize that the CO particularly is being formed fairly high in the atmosphere. They're not thin, you have to actually account for that material. So you get pretty strong non-Keplerian deviations because you have a vertical component to the velocity field. There's a pressure gradient. This is what causes radial drift to happen, right? This is just because of the pressure of the gas. There's self-gravity, which doesn't do a whole lot because we don't think these disks are very massive, um, but that would actually give you <coughs> super Keplerian rotation. And if you combine all these things, you get a difference. It's small. This is 2%. This is 5%. And this dashed region is where many of these warm molecular uh, emission lines are coming from. Um, so you're seeing sort of 2, two or 5%. And you think to yourself, this is, this is ridiculous. Can you actually measure that? And the answer is, you can measure it with ALMA observations, even in the SV data set. You can actually see the difference between accounting for these things. So much so that you're actually pushing material around by more than one spectral channel. Right? So you have to actually account for these when you model things, but it gives you an opportunity to use the velocity field to infer information about the structure of these disks. So that's an exciting possibility for the future. And so I'll just leave up my conclusions, and if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you.
So, Sean, um, this issue of uh, measuring H2, or the, the surface density of H2, are any of the lines that Alma can access so intrinsically narrow that it might be possible to do this by pressure broadening, by looking at the effect of the collisions? Uh, that's an interesting question. I, I, I haven't thought about that, to be honest. I, I sincerely doubt that would be the case. Um, you could have a scenario where you basically have no turbulence, say, in a dead zone. Um, but I, I still think it would actually be warm enough there that it would be difficult to do that. But that's an interesting question. I, I don't know that people have looked into that. Do you know? Okay, never mind. Great talk, Sean. So um, we have been talking about signposts of, by single planet, you know, the, with the wolf kind of simulation. Um, but do we actually have an estimation of when exactly we would be able to start to see this kind of feature with Alma? I, I'm sorry. Say that again. So, um, you know, so we have been talking about signposts produced by a single planet right. from this planet interaction, you know, the Sebastian Wolf kind of simulation. But I guess the current Alma um, observational condition is not uh, good enough to, uh, to actually resolve this kind of feature. So do we have an estimation of when exactly we would be able to see them? Well, I think if you had a single planet at something like 2030 AU, and you have, uh, I mean, you could do this in sight, you could do this now, right? If you had a single planet at 2030 AU and enough material was getting across it, what you'd see is basically a bright peak in the center and then you'd see a ring outside of a depression. And that couldn't be a multi-planet system because you should have cleared more of that material. Um, that's, that's about as close as you're going to get. Um, so you, you, know, you can have access for the closest, um, for the closest, like TW Hydra and V4046 Edge, you have sort of sub 10 AU resolution already with cycle one. So you should be able to start doing that now. All right. Um, is there an inconsistency between what we heard this morning about uh, the rarities of stellar companions right. with direct imaging and your one-third right. of uh, uh, transitional disks? So this is not a plant, but I swear to God, Doug asks me this question every time I see him. <laughs> so he very well knows the answer. But uh, <laughs> the. The, the transition disks that we see are very common, but the sample that we're drawing from is incredibly biased, right? So we're looking at only the most massive, brightest disks, and in that population, a third of them have these cavities. But it makes sense if, if planet formation is much more efficient in more massive systems, which basically, no matter what planet formation model you use, that, that's going to happen. Um, so we could be preferentially picking off the systems that, that have that. So until we have a good demographic you know, if, until we have a same sensitivity, same resolution survey of a full range of the, of the luminosity function, I can't really answer that question. But it's a, it's a very important question. I think it will take a little while um, to build up those statistics. Um, but it's, a, it's an important demographic question, yeah. Sean, uh, you were inferring uh, very high values of uh, beta of the opacity slope in uh, some of your uh, plots, as far as I understand, at least. Yeah. Uh, so you're getting something uh, beta on the order of uh, three or something in the outer parts of the disk. Yeah. How do you actually, what, what sort of material do you need to get such high values of beta? So I, I have to say this is, a, this is a artifact. We think what this is is, a, is that it's actually an artifact, right? So what's happening is that you get, you get out to 100 AU or something in these disks. And then we don't actually see any more centimeter emission at all, right? So you're fitting a power law to zero at the longest wavelength, right? So it's just an artifact of, of the representation of, of beta. So when it gets above... Upper or so yeah, you could, effectively, you could effectively assign an upper limit. But we haven't done that, right? So it's, it's just an artifact of the, the power law fit to the spectrum. Uh, okay. Yeah, we can cut it off there. <laughs> Hey, Sean, thanks for the, this great review. You briefly showed uh, some uh, recent ALMA data on the disk that uh, showed a clear difference between the SMA map, a uh, ring on the yeah. SMA, 
we, and a centrally picked uh, source on the ALMA data. Could you comment a little bit on the differences? Do you yeah, think you may be it. seeing maybe the star, or is it a central peak on the, on the dust continuum? Right, so here. Um, it is not the star. It's 100 times brighter than the star. Actually, I think it's more like 500 times brighter than the star. It's not the star, and it's not any radio contamination. It's 430 <coughs> microns. There's no radio mechanism that can actually produce that. That's dust. It's warm dust. It's inside the cavity. So the question, the question is basically, um, we haven't done the modeling yet for this, to be fair. Um, but the question is, is it, is it inconsistent? And I think the answer is no. And the reason is just optical depth effects. This emission in this central peak, it's optically thick. It's 4, 430 microns. It doesn't take a lot of density to become optically thick. But at one millimeter, it's going to be optically thin. So we're just sensitivity limited. I think that's going to be the answer. But um, stay tuned. We have a VLA map at about the same angular resolution. So we can, we can check that. Um, uh, but yeah, that, that is a very interesting part. I'm glad you caught it. We have two more questions, one there and one here. I was wondering, in the issue of estimating disk surfaces, surface densities, uh, one way you can do that, of course, is from the dust and then just extrapolate with the constant gas to solid ratio. And then, of course, a lot of people have shown that that doesn't really work because the gas to solid ratio changes. And I'm wondering if you know of any efforts to, um, to model what the gas to solid ratio really is if you have solids at different stages of evolutions, like if they've grown to large grains or even to planetesimal sizes. Right. This is, it. This is exactly what I was trying to get at at this point. So, so we are seeing the signature here that in the inner part of the disk you have larger solids, in the outer mm -hmm. part of the disk you have smaller solids. And now connecting that to the, to the dust to gas ratio is, is the hard part. And, and it's not easy to do that. I was trying to explain here. here. Um, and part of the reason is that we don't have a good uh, model prescription for how the gas to dust ratio should vary with radius. But, but my postdoc Till Bernstein, we're working on coming up with some sort of analytic prescription that actually makes more sense than what we're using now. Right now, we can say that it's clear that there's a variation in the dust to gas ratio, but it's difficult to actually quantify it. So, so we are working on it, but um, uh, it's just getting started. So, yeah. A related question. I wondered if you had some kind of observational constraint on the actual time scales at which the grain growth is occurring on, um, or is this always model dependent? Uh, it will be model dependent, but it's it's sort of even worse than that. I regret to say <laughs> that. Um, Ideally, what you could do is empirically get a time scale and compare the, the grain growth signatures in these sort of million-year-old clusters with them in a few million-year-old clusters or something like that, um, get some information empirically. But the models for particle growth all are too fast. Um, so I mean, this, this growth and drift process is happening much faster than the observations allow. Um, and so that's, that's a lingering issue that I, I don't personally know the solution to, but maybe someone else has a good idea. But that, that's still an issue. So I, I can't give you really time scale information, unfortunately. Okay, let's